Hold on to your butt. Come on, sucker. Let's get it on. Oh, you want to fight? You want to fight? I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. You don't know anybody named Iris? I don't know nobody named Iris. Can I have a piece of toast? I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Western demands. How could you do this to me? Blit, I want to know. Why did you do that? What you feel only matters to you. Step back for one minute and look at the big picture. And that's all. No, no, not for the real fire. The orphans bond a family that very few can understand. Help me. Help you. <laughs> I don't do drugs. Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I am your co-host Iris and I am here with my older brother Wesley. Today we are discussing a new movie released Christmas Day 2020 available on VOD News of the World. Who is like super stoked for News of the World? Mom and Dad. Were they excited about it? Yeah I think mom said quote damn good. Damn good because what I saw was dude reads the news. Dude finds a girl. Dude protects girl. Dude adopts girl. Yeah. I mean, this movie is not going to be remembered for its storyline. No. Did you ever have any doubt of how this movie was going to end from the first frame? Uh, well, the first frame was Tom Hanks putting on a shirt, which yep. wasn't particularly inspiring. Nope. But we did get to see the scars he bears from the Civil War. Tom Hanks is not a verbose one. He doesn't talk about his traumas and personal experiences, very much like his other captain in Saving Private Ryan, very private and reserved. <laughs> but we saw, we saw, you know, the gunshot wounds and... And shaky-handed. Yes, he went through the horrors of war, but he didn't explain the fact that he got shot up or anything. That seems pretty serious. Only Tom Hanks, man, can make a Confederate captain empathetic, right? Or like even noble. Honestly, I didn't even get that distinction. Was he Confederate? Oh, I guess he's in the South. Yep. There was nothing about this movie to me that was Paul Greengrassy. I mean, there were gunfights and all that stuff, but there were still like, bam, run and hide, throw a rock to distract a dude, bam, and the dude falls over. He's fighting with birdshot. I mean, did he not have problems before he encountered Johanna because he's like, I can't take you with me, even though he had no problems before, as evidenced by the fact that he only had a shotgun basically for looks and filled with birdshot. No, he was head down, war burdened, itinerant newsman who went from town to town and minded his own business. But yeah, Johanna came with her own set of problems and she also turned him into a bit of a rabble rouser, which brought out other problems. Yeah, it seemed unnecessary knowing that she is his charge and that he's trying to stir up as little trouble as possible to defy the dude in Erath or whatever. Like, why wouldn't you just go along with Top Hat Man? When you know you're in a compromised position. Wasn't that also the town where he's like, we're in a strange place with a strange name. Why don't you go off and play or whatever? And he had no idea where she was. She was collecting dimes for the firefight later on. Especially after these mercenary, like, would-be pimps try and buy her. Right. And she's like, I don't know, girls play. Maybe this was just like, girl, got to go play. Girl, got to go to her relatives. Girl, got to do farming. That's what her life is. Except not. <laughs> Girl got to get tied to the stake. <laughs> At least not burned. And it's like, okay, obviously we, the, one of the dangers with a young girl is that everybody wants to rape her and everybody's going to be a creeper, right? And then they go from that to this weird dictatorship town in Erath where you got the mean guy overseeing the town and it's just this hive of scum and villainy. All the fake news and the social and civil unrest. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> it feels like this movie is going through progressive circles of hell. Like we're going to come out the other side, but first we have the Wild, Wild West rape fantasy storyline and then like the evil town. It was almost like a video game. You called it sequences and you called it circles, which I think belies the episodic kind of event based structure. This is like the modern day adult version of Natty Gan, where you've got <laughs> itinerant people going on a mission and just like getting hit up left and right the whole way. Like this is just a sequence of bad events. That's what it should be called. Bad events on the road. <laughs> Western 
sequence of bad events. <laughs> and and yet none of them were really noteworthy because after the two circles of hell that were Erath and trying to get away from the would-be rapists, they kind of settled where he was going to end up and where he went and visited his wife's grave. And they kind of came to terms with the, you know, he came to terms with the fact that she wasn't going to be OK. She would be better off despite his misgivings when he if he goes and gets her back. Well, she would be better off, but also he would be better off. I mean, this this only works when it goes both ways. Right. They needed each other the entire time. I guess. But did they really need each other? Because for a while it was pretty midnight sky and he was like, OK, so do some stuff or whatever. And then she disappears <laughs> in the sandstorm and he's like, Johanna. And I was like, here come the wolves. And it wasn't the wolves. It was the Indians. <laughs> well, as far as reluctant caretakers go, Tom Hanks was kind of a big softy. Yeah. Um, it was a beard movie. He warmed up. <laughs> he warmed up pretty quickly. And it was pretty clear that he needed her and certainly when he dropped her off you're like all right well he kind of has no purpose in life now so when he went to go back and finish up business or tie up loose ends about his wife and stuff like that's when everything became super inevitable and predictable like he had there was no he had no other meaning in life other than to go back to johanna and you think that the kid was just trouble because you think all kids in movies are just trouble well I mean, no, what you do is make the kid damn near a mute like you did in Midnight Sky or you make it so she doesn't speak English. And she's like, ha, blah, 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 blah in Kiowa. And then you're like, OK, whatever, we'll figure it out later. <laughs> so they did away with the annoying kid problem by just having her not speak English? Maybe. And she was a professional actress. It's not like they found her out in the West scrabbling in the dirt and like want to be in a movie with Tom Hanks, even though, get this, Having been, she's like 11 years old, having been an actress since she was like five or six. I think she had her first starring, like her leading role at seven. She claims she had no clue who Tom Hanks was. Well, he's not on YouTube. Yeah, I guess. But but Tom Hanks said that he is a man who is kind of broken by his past and going from place to place. And he lives a transitory lifestyle and finds comfort in the barmaid lady or whatever. Is very Natty Gann in that way, too. Oh, my God. It's so Natty Gann. Uh, he said that love transforms a person. And in that way, yes, he needed her and she contributed to his life, certainly in the way that he contributed to better her life. He also took something from it, a love relationship that he wasn't too gruff to anticipate. He wasn't the like, goddamn kid. He wasn't Rooster Cogburn yelling at precocious Matty, <laughs> Matty. <laughs> Maddie Gann. True grit reference. Yeah. And you can see he just wanted what was best for her, but it wasn't like, hey, girl can't keep up with me. It was more like she belongs in a place where she'll be safe with family, and that's probably not best with me until he realizes it is. What he realizes is that neither of them belong anywhere or with anyone but each other. I guess. Because he doesn't have a family. He doesn't have, I mean, like all of his, whatever he was fighting for in the war is done. He doesn't have his printing business. She doesn't have a Kiowa family. She doesn't have a German family. I mean, they're basically rootless, right? And they're, and, and a life on the road together is, uh, is where they belong. And specifically, the movie didn't set up any other opportunities. I mean, once we did away with the lady that Tom Hanks kind of gives some exposition to for his situation with his wife, there are no other lasting characters. And so it was inevitable that they were going to, it was going to be them or nothing. It felt brief and inconsequential in some ways. I wondered if Tom Hanks hadn't been Tom Hanks, dude, and it had been someone else, if I would have cared. This movie is all Tom Hanks, although News of the World is kind of a cool title. And I thought it had more potential than they than they or maybe the novel explores. Like News of the World is pretty cool. Like this idea that, you know, there's one man connecting societies. Like I anticipated that he was going to be some kind of the harbinger of good or bad news. And, you know, some thing that's really going to usher them into this new era and blah, blah, blah. But it was something much smaller, much subtler than that. Yeah, I wondered. I was trying to figure out how the theme of this movie and his job connected symbolically or metaphorically to his journey with her. She was obviously an international figure, but that's about as far as I got. I wasn't like, oh, see, because he's a newspaper reader guy and it ties into blah, blah, blah. It wasn't it didn't really come together in that way. 
it was more about how the story made an impact on his profession as a traveling newsman than it was about how his profession as a traveling newsman affected other people. Like, it's used to illustrate that he goes from this guy who's just reading the news from town to town to someone who sees his reading of the news as a platform to entertain and inspire and educate and maybe even change people's thinking or change the way a society or community looks at themselves like he did Erath. The title had promise, and I'm sure there was a lot more. It was a lot more involved in the book, but maybe we'll fall through the cracks a little bit because it's so simple, and Tom Hanks will be the draw, and that will kind of be it. I would have thought that Paul Greengrass, when I found out that he was directing it, I was like, he has the opportunity to make any situation tense because Captain Phillips, a lot of it was talking on a big boat that didn't maneuver. It's like, how do you take this measured Western with Tom Hanks, where a lot of it is contemplative and on his face, and make it exciting? And I thought that the gunfight, as cool as it was, was a little bit reserved. I thought, coming in, that it would be filled with much more undercurrent than it was. Like subtext? Well, just an underlying sense of drama and urgency that she's always kind of in peril. And I didn't feel like that until peril was immediate. But it seemed like kind of a mature turn for both Paul Greengrass, who's obviously an accomplished filmmaker, and Tom Hanks. Like they went for a more subtle approach to telling the story. I mean, Tom Hanks said it was a Western, but only because of the setting and the period and the clothes. He said otherwise it's people finding love and and finding a relationship and human connection and all that stuff. Because it was such simple storytelling that you did expect there might be something deeper or more subtextual going on. And that didn't really happen. When they meet in the in the town, right? And the, the would-be pimps are like, hey, blonde, blue eyes, like she'd fetch a lot of money. And he's like, she's not for sale. And then they get into a little quarrel. And then Tom Hanks puts like, does the thing where he takes the dude by the collar and puts them up against the wall that thing that dudes do when they try and show that they're tough yeah like you know in that moment that you're like tom hanks just has no chance against these guys like he looks kind of sad and old oh i mean not in a bad way like in a you know just showing his real signs of age way and then you think okay so this is where tom hanks street smarts and wits are going to like rise to the occasion and he's gonna he's gonna outwit these guys in this rock clambery shootout thing and then he kind of really doesn't i mean if anyone outwits the the scumbags it's joanna and her dime shot yep and he just kind of you know is the only thing that captain kidd brings to the party is his principle that he's gonna protect joanna until he dies (laughs) <laughs> and which I, I honestly thought he was going to do. And it's it's about the principle, right? If he's nothing, if not a man of principles. And uh, yeah, when putting up that dude up against the wall, it made me think of Alec Baldwin when they put him in a fight scene with Henry Cavill in uh, a couple of missions of Mission Impossibles ago. It's like, no, 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 you're not going to stand up against Superman and try to punch him. Like, not for a second is that fight going to go in your favor. And also when he put that dude up against the wall, he turned his back to everybody else and Johanna. And that would have been the opportunity for them to snatch her and run away. That's true. But some things came together. Like, it wasn't just like, you know, hey, she's not for sale. Let's move on and have dinner. And then they were, like, chasing her. And he's like, wait, what's what's happening? They're chasing us? He knew that once he got out of town, he because he was hightailing it, he knew long before they were in view that they were chasing him. And... Additionally, they tied thematically some things together. It was like in Bruges, where the coins in the pocket come in handy later. And they set that up for a very deliberate reason. It seemed fortuitous that he would have a bucket full of dimes to go with his birdshot shotgun. With the perfect caliber. And the little girl with the Kayo and knowledge. Right, exactly. All that tied together. And I was like, that's cool. They did a cool thing with the use of the dimes. And it made a lot of sense because it's basically as effective as, as full like buckshot. It was also uh, used, spoiler, in uh, Young Guns too. So I knew exactly what was happening. And I was like, that's genius. And it was cool that because I was like, he's making his living a dime at a time. Okay. But it came in handy because it saved his life. And, and there, it meant to say that it wasn't dynamic. It was just like, kabam, I know what you want, kabam, give us the girl, kabam. And they would like trade firing. But he did outsmart them and it did feel tense. And he 
eventually overcame three dudes while also trying to protect the little girl. I think they kept their heads up a little bit more than they should have. But it wasn't, certainly it wasn't a, okay, guys, I'm Paul Greengrass, and we're going to meticulously choreograph this fight. And no, 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 you got to keep your head down, and bullets should be whizzing at all times. It was just kind of, not lazy, but it was slower than some gunfights. The Western genre kind of only survives on it being pushed forward, like like you like to talk about Pixar animation, if it's pushed forward in some way, right? Like, well, does this does this advance the Western genre? I don't think it does. I don't even think. I mean, that I mean, fight certainly didn't. There have been lots of slow westerns where kind of nothing really happens, uh, and and a lot of those are fine because I like living in this world. But you know the mark of a slow movie as opposed to a hop-in movie is when they take entire scenes to go back and revisit a house where stuff happened like eight years ago and nothing has happened since, right? It was like Nomadland checking in on the old house where the girl used to live, where she used to live with her husband, spoiler, and uh, they'll like think about stuff. And like look at little lace gloves and... And it tells a story, but it, but it tells a slower story than we'd expect. There's always this idea that the West was a dying age. You know, the last days of the gunfighter before the telegraph came in or the railroad came through town and messed up the small towns and became all about commerce and stuff. And that's fine. It's a backdrop. But I like Westerns. I'm not sure that a Western has to add to the genre each time because Westerns, for me, are like comfort food. And sometimes comfort food, like Taco Bell, is technically food that you are familiar with, but that doesn't mean it's the highest quality. I'm not saying News of the World was Taco Bell, but it was. It didn't have to be, oh, man, I've had macaroni before, but this is truffle mac and, mac and cheese. You know, it wasn't gourmet Western. Just to be clear, Taco Bell is not traditional Mexican food. No, but you go back to the things that you that are familiar and comforting from when you were a kid. Like a Frito boat? No, dude, Taco Boat in middle yeah. school, that was the bomb. With the sauce all over it. But still I saw I saw a thing like DoorDash. Taco Bell is on DoorDash now and I saw that stupid cheesy gordita crunch or whatever. Yeah. And I have this weird fixation on it. I can't stop thinking about it, but it makes no sense because it's crap. There are lots of movies that are cheesy gordita crunches that I like them because I feel comfortable in that world, but they're also kind of crap. And is this is News of the World one? Is News of the World one of those movies? It's not. News of the World is not the cheesy gordita crunch of westerns. Because Sling Blade is the honey mustard pretzel yep. of independent movies. <laughs> That's out in the world now. So I was hoping that different things would happen. What ended up happening is exactly what I thought would happen. They have a language barrier, and then they don't. They have struggles, and then they get through them. He gets rid of her and then has to come to terms with the idea that he doesn't want to get rid of her. He goes back. You know he's going to ask for her forgiveness. And you know after a tantrum, she's going to forgive him. And that they're going to ride off into the sunset together. But the satisfaction doesn't come from the surprise in this scene. Like, I, I just rewatched this scene before we started this review. And it's pretty moving. And it's beautifully shot. And both he and the actress, Helena Zengel, take a really light touch to the performance. Like, it's subtle and the dude's got the shotgun and it's cocked and it's ready to go and then he kind of lowers it and he's and they're all giving in to the inevitability and it's just kind of beautifully staged and and shot and and it's emotional and then ultimately unsatisfying why is that because i think we've seen versions of this movie that challenged our expectations because they are postmodern cinema of the original american genre and we're used to white hat, black hat, good guy win, bad guy die, um, good guy, white hat gets girl or whatever. And that was almost what News of the World was. Tom Hanks was never a bad guy. There was no question morally about his intentions with the girl, which had to be sound, I guess, if we had if we were going to acknowledge that him not being akin to her was going to take her on full time. And it just never challenged me. It was lovely and nice. Which is why this is a good uh, movie for mom and dad. Maybe that's the case. But it just, you think if, if Tom Hanks is going to be drawn back into this genre, 
uh, after all these years, you know, you think he would bring buckshot or the surprise of cartridges full of dimes as opposed to birdshot. This is kind of a birdshot movie. You love Westerns. How does this work as a Western? It's my favorite Tom Hanks Western. <laughs> is he in any other Western? What? How dare you? This is his fifth Western character. Tell me. Do you you don't remember the classic 1950s Woody's Roundup? <laughs> he had a snake in his boot. He he saved Jesse from old Stinky Pete. He rode on what was what was the, what was the horse's name? Buckshot. No. Uh, Buckeye. Yeah, I was gonna say Buckeye too, but that's definitely not it. It's something. Woody's I. horse. <laughs> Woody's bullseye. Bullseye. We are almost there. <laughs> Sorry, the Pixar westerns within Toy Story movies don't work. How dare you? And if we are going to consider these westerns, then how could you say that Captain Kid is better than Woody Woody the cowboy? You can't. <laughs> I can't. What do you? So how personally? I want to get you. Know, I want to get your personal take on this. Well. Westerns were basically the Bond movies of the Old West, right? They were, he was brave and enterprising and quick on the draw and quick with the ladies and all that stuff. And they had those components, which are essential. And then postmodern Westerns kind of brought that around. We got the sort of grittier anti-hero Westerns with the Sergio Leone spaghetti Westerns. And then Unforgiven came along where it wasn't just about the guns. He was a broken down old guy. He was a farmer who was not meant to be the killer that everyone expected him to be. He wasn't the fastest draw. Maybe he was the smartest draw. And so once we break those conventions, we can get Westerns that are more about just civilized life in these towns and the lawlessness of the outskirts and how we have these bursts of violence, which I think typify the lifestyle of the time. And so in that way, I was happy to live in this world where it was more about day-to-day life and not about necessarily the fantastic nature of the time that El Guapo and the cowboys came to town and, uh, and raided the village and made off with the women and, and all that stuff. El Guapo and the cowboys, was that a Three Amigos and a Tombstone reference? Yeah, but it's just like, they're coming! Dun, 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 yeehaw! And they're like shooting and running, riding in at the same time. It wasn't like that. It was just like circumstantially, <laughs> he upset the wrong people by trying to protect this kid and, and thus had to protect himself by extension outside of the bounds of the town's law. I don't know. It was simple and maybe like what the old Western TV shows would have been like as opposed to a film, which tends to focus on the more heightened elements. There was like the wagon wheel oh, yeah. thing. <laughs> that wheel almost <laughs> came off. Well, no, they did. And, they jumped. Uh, they had to jump off the thing. Then they had to jump, yeah. And then there was, uh, didn't they have an animal encounter? Uh, you have to have an animal encounter or see, a stream crossing think or so. something. These are the conventions that these types of Westerns live by. It was just, what obstacle are we going to face next so that we can make this a feature film until he gets to Castroville? So check it. How about this? I've talked about country music and how popular country music is not my jam at all. But there's a thing with musicians from around the world where they have this fascination with country music. The Beatles were kind of country at time, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and stuff, they focused a lot on blues. Led Zeppelin was a lot about the blues and they revered these musicians of different types that were quintessentially American music styles. And so everyone loves the Westerns, right? And Paul Greengrass being a not American dude, being a British dude, maybe sees this as a romantic genre that he really, really likes and emulates it in a way that's not the American Western way because it's got a decided spin or a different flavor, a slightly different flavor than the Westerns that we've come to expect. It did have an interesting international flavor to focus on immigrants in the Wild West. That's kind of a new take. Right. It has been done before, but not just, I mean, she was the stand in for the noble savage type, right? Where she was wild, but also certainly not above the idea that she would be, you know, a wonderful person that he would take on and try to protect. She deserved his care, even if she was quote-unquote wild and taken 
from the savages, taken back from the savages who had taken her. I mean, we examined that trope in Dances with Wolves. It was an amalgamation, I think, of a British filmmaker's view of Westerns. And I love this from this one, and I love that from this one, and this is what a Western should be. And it becomes an amalgamation that's not altogether memorable, but has its own little comforting flavor that I didn't mind. I minded no parts of News of the World. I wasn't like, oh man, that was that they shouldn't have gone in that direction. But the one they did was entirely unsurprising. There's some really beautiful cinematography, pretty epic score, like some nice set decorating. It's kind of a shame that the craft of this filmmaking kind of can't be appreciated because it's not really utilized in service of the story. I don't think anybody could say this movie was bad. If anything, maybe our perspective is such that we're so familiar with almost every element of this story from another movie that it becomes a little bit boring. And maybe this is Paloma's first Western. She will love Westerns. I mean, I thought it was a well-executed film to spec, to like, to Western spec. Yeah, well, I think what we what we keep coming at is it was so good. Why wasn't it better? Yeah. I was watching the behind the scenes stuff and I saw the dude with the beard and the hat and I was like, who's that dude? I don't remember him in the movie at all. And I think he was one of the would be uh, abductors, rapists. But I can't be sure because no one really stood out very much except the principal characters, uh, of which there were only two. And Kelly thought that everyone in this movie was Shia LaBeouf. She's like, is that Shia LaBeouf? He's kind of got Shia nose. He's kind of got Shia face. That that guy looks like Shia too. And they all sort of look the same. And I, I, I didn't think that. I thought Now that was, would be a movie. It was more Miles Teller for me. It was just kind of a generally bland looking face obscured by a hat and a beard. And I think that's fitting for this movie. <laughs> as, as a lar- in, in the larger picture and that all the pieces were in place and the, it, everybody kind of and the whole movie was kind of Shia LaBeouf but wasn't <laughs> I kind of really want to see that movie actually yeah where just like Shia LaBeouf's entire family and everyone related to him takes over this western landscape and people are like all being John Malkovich and stumbling through it being like what's happening everybody looks like this dude <laughs> yeah that I mean, have we done? Have you done that? The uh, the psychological thriller western? No, we've got horror westerns, you know, like vampire <laughs> westerns. <laughs> All right. Well, the time has come, Wes. Was it good enough? Is the question. Dun dun dun. It was the Shia LaBeouf of westerns. Who can be? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what is your rating? Nothing I didn't like about News of the World. I guess unless I could be from the privileged position of saying, I needed something more. I wanted it to really shake things up. And I know that that's been a downfall for other movies where, look, if you're going to have this deficiency, if it's not going to be well acted or directed, then it has to contribute something lasting to movies. But I think the opposite is true here. I think it was well made, well directed, well acted. Uh, everything was in place. Didn't necessarily have to push things forward to be enjoyable, did, but didn't make it the standout totally rating. Definitely an all right movie for me. It just neat. I it would have been neato to have a little more frosting on this cake, but cake is delicious. <laughs> the weirdest analogies in this movie review, I have to say that I enjoyed Sonic the Hedgehog a little bit more than I enjoyed News of the World because at least Sonic the Hedgehog was charming. Wow. Didn't I give Sonic a nope? Maybe. And I gave it a good because it it officially marked me as an old lady. And News of the World is reviving my youth and I'm saying I demand better and I demand more and I'm not going to be placated by this movie what are you about to do you know what i'm just saying tom hanks only gets so many passes because greyhound was tom hanks dude and i can't say news the news of the world was tom hanks dude then i'd just be redundant i dare you to do it jerk that fine i give it a good (laughs) man that was a close one only on or whatever movies does news of the world get compared to sonic the hedgehog sonic the hedgehog comes out as a clear victor (laughs) that is our review on news of the world let us know what you think how do people contact us wes 818-834-0444 818-835-0473 or whatevermovies at gmail.com. Uh, Wes is doing a lot better on as our social media ambassador, so hit him up. Thank you for listening, 
and we'll see you next time.